Let me say good evening to you. It is 6.25, actually just turning 6.26. We're going to begin our Bible study period in just about three and a half to four minutes. Uh, we try to start promptly at 6.30. Uh, so for the members and the friends and the guests of New Hebron, if you don't mind, uh, when you log on, just be able to greet one another and say hello to everybody. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed their Easter celebration this past Sunday, spent time at a local church, or if you were in a home, you spent time learning the word via social media sites, the internet, or television, or just reading your Bible. For those that don't know me, my name is Rodney Smith Sr., and I pastor New Hebron Missionary Baptist Church, where God has blessed me to be for over 14 years now. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. We have a very exhaustive study tonight. I have no problem telling you that if you don't have your Bible, you're going to be in trouble. It's Bible study. Uh, you do need to have a Bible. So get your Bibles out. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 7. Good evening to everyone, Sister Mahomes, to my aunt. Roberta, to Deacon and Sister Davis, to Sister Waller, to Brother Tidwell, to my cousin John and Tanya, to the Tim's family. God bless all of you. I hope everyone is doing good on this kind of wet, but yet it's kind of cool outside too. So I still have my coffee ready. Mm, a little too hot that time, but uh, I still have my coffee ready and we're raring to go tonight. Uh, tonight, we're going to look at uh, uh, a kind of a survey, a brief survey of the life of Stephen. Stephen, which was one of the first deacons that were selected in Acts chapter 6. And we're going to look at Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 7. And we're going to look at, you know, how Stephen was faithful in spite of all that he went through. Deacon Smith, good to have you with us. Uh, let's, let's get down to it. We're going to be in Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7. And we're going to look at all that Stephen went through on behalf of the Lord, all that Stephen had to deal with. Um, Stephen's ministry life from when he was selected to be a deacon to when he was ultimately martyred was two to three days. Very short, but still very intense and so we're going to look at the life of Stephen just briefly. We're going to kind of peruse through Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 7, and then we're going to kind of make some conclusion and make some applications uh, to our lives as far as being faithful to the Lord and all that we do. Go ahead on this cool night and get your coffee. Sister Turner, God bless you. Good to have you with us. Hello to everyone. If I haven't seen the name or the face or if I've missed it, please charge it to my head and not to my heart. It certainly is not intentional. Uh, I've said in the past, sometimes I kind of go back and I'll see messages that people will put on there and saying hello and I just happen to miss it. So uh, good evening to all of you, Sister Halton, to the good sister, Sister Burnett, the Burnett family. God bless you and everyone that is there. So we're going to begin in just a few moments. Once again, tonight, we're going to be in Acts chapter 6, in Acts chapter 7. Uh, I want to encourage you, uh, to inform you, you certainly are going to need your Bible. It is Bible study. Sometimes we don't want to rush through. We want to kind of scan and then pause in certain places and highlight a few things that we need to learn, that we need to kind of emphasize for our understanding and for our uh, strength and growth. So we've made it to 630. We're going to go ahead and get started. I don't want to be guilty of not being respectful of the hour. So I want to ask you to pause what you're doing uh, and all the members and all of the friends and guests. Let's have a word of prayer. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Deacon. Deacon Smith, let's have us a word of prayer, and we're going to start right now. So, Father, we, we come to you. Uh, we come in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this day, for waking us up, for protecting us, for providing for us. Even if difficulty did step in at one point or another, 
we still made it to this time. And so, Father, at this point, we pray that you can give us a, a covering, that you can insulate us from the cares, concerns of this world and help us just to have these private moments with you and your word. Help us to see the example of Stephen in your word. Help us to model and to apply faithfulness into our lives and to every area of it. Lord, we can't do it without you. So we thank you for hearing our prayer. We trust that you'll do just what we've asked, Father, to enrich us and to help us to grow as your people. We ask you this in the name of Jesus. And they all said, amen, amen, and amen. So we're going to be talking about faithfulness tonight. It's Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7. I'm going to go ahead and turn back to, to Acts chapter 6. And we have to tell a complete story as it relates uh, to Stephen. Stephen, Sister Waller, was one of the first deacons selected. And we want to use his life as kind of a springboard to learn lessons about us as Christians becoming faithful servants of the God that we serve. Now, just to give a bit of background, first of all, before we get to our lesson, or excuse me, to give this example a, a bit of background for myself, uh, my home church is a Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, many of us know it as Third and Bender. Uh, I kind of cut my teeth there. I joined that church, oh, early 20s. And I was the average 20-something-year-old. You know, I would go on major events, but that was about it. Um, I remember having a distinct period in my life as a husband, as a father, where I just wanted to be better. You know, I, I wanted to be more. I, I got sick of the nightlife the endlessness of the street life, and, and, and there's nothing in it for you. There's nothing out there for you, you know, running from place to place and all kinds of nonsense. And I just decided, well, let me, let, let me just see what this church thing is about. And I just distinctly remember growing and growing and growing. And whenever you put forth an effort to grow, it seems like Satan will one way or another throw a stumbling block, a roadblock. And there are some good people at that church. Many people, I'm sure, and trust are still there. But it was a troubled church. It was plagued with a lot of internal problems of which I was ill-equipped to handle. I just thought everybody that goes to church does what's right and tries to do the right thing. And that is true for the vast majority of people that go to church. They're trying to better themselves. And, you know, you do have other situations that do arise. And when I was introduced to some of the things that took place behind the scenes, it hurt me. It, 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 it affected me. Like somebody put a thumbs up or an amen if you've ever been, I like to use this phrase, church hurt, to where you saw something in the church, you were like, well, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's, it's kind of like seeing how hot dogs are made or seeing how sausage is made. And you're like, oh, I didn't know all this went into it. And I remember one distinct day. 2610 Shake Hole, little greenhouse, 900 square feet, laying in that bed, looking at the ceiling fan on a Sunday evening, and I said these words out loud. I ain't going back no more. Mm-mm. I'm done. There's this, there's that, there's this, there's that, there's this, this, this. I tried to work it. I, I, I tried to fix it. I thought, you know, I just thought when you do right, everything falls together. Well, ultimately it does, but it comes at a price. And that was a watershed moment for me. My faithfulness to the Lord was really put to the test. And that's kind of what we see when we look at Stephen. Stephen's life is, it is a picture 
of faithfulness. So Stephen, as we look at Acts chapter 6, yes, yeah, church hurt can make you cry many tears. As we look at Acts chapter 6, we're going to look at uh, just in general, verses 1 through 7. And this is where, and we're not going to be too specific, this is where they were dividing the goods between the poor members of the New Testament church. And there was an internal problem. Some of the Grecians, the Greek-speaking Hebrews, had a problem with the Hebrews. It's kind of like the native Hebrews. It said, hey, listen, as y'all passing out this food and stuff, our widows are being neglected. And it's kind of like, it, it, it seemed like for the Greek-speaking speak, Jews who were not from the area, they said, there's a good old boy system going on here, and we need to fix this. The apostles, as they were praying, ministering and studying the word, trying to hear literally from God, well, they're trying to do that and handle these differences, and they said, we need some help. And that's when they selected deacons. In Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, these men are not called deacons per se, but they do fit the criteria of what we now know in the New Testament church as deacons. And they said, listen, they said, listen, y'all look out among you for seven men filled with the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Bring them to us. We'll set them over this business. That way, we can handle internal problems. We will have some faithful, Holy Spirit-filled men to assist us in ministry. And we can give ourselves to prayer, to studying the ministry of the word. And the result, if you look at Acts chapter 6, verse 7, the result is the word of God increased. The number of disciples was multiplied greatly. And so you can see this worked, getting some men to handle differences in the church, giving the apostles, or we would now say the church leadership, an adequate opportunity to pray and to study. Well, the church was blessed as a whole. So, boom, New Testament church made it. When you get to Acts chapter 8, well, uh, I want to look here. Where is it? In Acts chapter 5, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 5, excuse me. In Acts chapter 6, verse 5, you see a listing of the men who were selected. The first name you see is Stephen. When you look in Acts chapter 6, you jump down to verse 8. It says, Stephen, he was a man that was full of faith and power and did great wonders and miracles among the people. And no soon as you get through a rough period to smooth waters, Satan is not done trying to tear down the church. Acts chapter 9, Lord, forgive me, verse 9 of Acts chapter 6. Then, there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia and of Asia. And it says these group of men, if you look in verse nine, they were disputing with Stephen. So we got some argument. We got some debate. We got some back and forth. And it's written in the Greek to where this was not a pleasant exchange. This was a literal dispute. It was aggressive. And we'll see how aggressive as we go down further through the chapter. Now, let's look at the groups. It says the synagogue of the Libertines. Some of your versions of the Bible may say the synagogue of free men. Men that were free. Synagogue of freed men. Also, you've got uh, Jews that were from, I'll put it back up here. Jews that were from Cyrene. 
Jews that were from Alexandria, Jews that were from Cilicia and Asia. So what is the purpose of listing all of these locations? Well, Jews, many of them were captured and made to be slaves in Rome. And when these Jews, they were captured by, it's assumed through history by the Roman Emperor Pompey. Well, at one point in their history, they let all these Jews go. They released them. You're free to go. You, 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 you've been emancipated. And all of these areas are areas where Jews begin to settle. Some kind of a way. They heard about Stephen. They showed up to where Stephen was, and they began disputing with Stephen, who was one of the first deacons. All these cities, as I said, were cities where the Jews had been dispersed. And they started, Satan started Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, with an inside attack, murmuring. Now Satan intensifies it. If he can't get you at the front door, he'll take the back door. Now we have an outside attack. You got this large contingent of individuals, whether it's one or two people from each one of these territories, we don't know exactly how many it was, but you have multiple people disputing with Stephen. And we'll see later in a sense of what they were disputing with Stephen about when they came on the attack. Now, let me say this. Whenever you stand firm, live out what the Bible says, or whenever you stand firm on the principles of what God's word says, let alone if you stand firm and you preach and you teach line upon line, precept upon precept, oftentimes trouble will come. That's not to make you negative. That's not to make you become pessimistic. That is just a fact that whenever you make your mind up to do for the Lord, Satan will see to it that it will not always be an easy transition or a smooth walk road that you have to walk. Whenever there, there, there's a cultural phrase, many of us may have heard this, and it says, the truth always has a scratched face. What that means is you can get in more trouble doing what is right than you ever could doing something that is wrong. Now, how many of us have experienced that? How, how you just wanted to get yourself more active in church. You, you, you used to be more devoted. You used to be more involved. You recognize where you are as opposed to where you used to be. And let's just say, for example, you pray and you pray the whole week and you said, no matter what, I'm going to Sunday school. No matter what, I'm going to be there. I'm going to get up early. I'm going to bed early. I'm going to get my clothes out. I'm going to do it. And on that very Sunday, you decide to do that. There's some outbreak. There's some argument. There's some dispute. There's something that just turns your stomach to where you're like, oh, my goodness. It, it, it makes you feel like, what's the use? Satan knows what to do, how to arrange certain situations to on that very day that you said, I'm going to do better, and you follow through with it. Something will fall. Something will drop. Something will occur to where it will make you want to renege on your commitment. Because whenever you want to take a step closer, to being devoted to God, trouble is going to come. Stephen hadn't been a deacon before a few hours. Stephen hadn't been a deacon. He hadn't been a deacon for 20 years, 30 years. He just, as we could use our modern term, he's just been ordained into the deacon ministry. And as soon as he's doing what's right, look at what happened. Here's a dispute from all this large uh, com uh, 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 contingent of people. So we see verse 9 of Acts chapter 6. Now look down at verse number 10, Acts 6 and 10. And as they disputed, argued with him, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which Stephen spake. Here's what that verse means. The truth prevailed. 
listen, listen. Ultimately, you had these natural men that could not stand against a supernaturally empowered man. Stephen, they couldn't resist the wisdom and the spirit, Holy Spirit, by which Stephen spoke, by which he was teaching the words that he was saying. They had no real rebuttal, no real defense. They had no real way of winning against the truth. Listen, I've heard this phrase. We use the phrase in track when I ran track like the, the last leg of the relay, that normally is the fastest person. So if you're behind, that fast person will get that baton and he'll walk them down. I mean, he's not literally walking, but they may have a head start. But this person that's so much faster, if they have a head start, he can cut into that lead. And we would say, oh, he's going to walk him down. Back when I was at Pine Bluff High, Tracy Caldwell, it didn't care who was in front. That 100-meter relay, Tracy Caldwell would walk him down. Basil Shabazz, I saw him get out of his car eating Cheetos, stretch for a minute, and go run and set a state record. He'll walk him down. Well, here's, I, I, I want to borrow that phrase, and I want to lay it on the situation between the truth and a lie. The truth can walk down a lie every time. L listen, it's been said that a lie will take a trip around the world twice before the truth gets out of bed. But the truth will win every time. God's truth will win every time. This large contingent of individuals, they dispute with Stephen. He hasn't been ordained as a deacon for a long time. But before he was selected to be someone to fill this role, he was already a man that was full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. If you look at verse number three, wherefore, brethren, Acts 6 and 3, we're looking for people to assist us in ministry. Look ye out among you for seven men who are honest, seven men who are full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Bring them to us that we can appoint them over this business. And look, it came into play because when Stephen was, we'll just say, verbally attacked in verse 9, in verse 10, they were unable to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. I want to pause, make an application right here. If you are looking for a reason to quit, to give up, to throw in the towel, you won't have to look far to find one. If you're looking for an excuse, a reason to say, I don't want to do this anymore, people people with carnal natures, fallen people who are trying to get it together. Satan, we know how he is against the church. If you're looking for an excuse to say, this ain't for me, you will find those readily available at every place you turn. You, you'll find them. That's not hard. Stephen has every excuse to say, what? This is the church. How is this mess happening in the church? After all God has done, blah, blah, blah. Stephen got plenty of reason to say, I quit but he was still faithful. He was still devoted. He was still willing to keep his hand in the wine and chain. So we see what Stephen went through. We see the truth uh, prevailed. Now, now we're, we're, we're taking our time. So look at what happened in verse 11. They couldn't resist the words that Stephen spoke. So they, so they suborned men would say it. We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. <laughs> the, the, the world has a mantra. The, the, the sinful people of the world, they have an ideology. They, 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 they have a calling card. If you can't beat them, lie. <laughs> what? <laughs> so guess what they did? They lied. They, they said, guess what? Instead of us going truth 
for truth. And maybe Stephen dismantled our perception, our belief about doctrine. And because what he said has offended us more than someone pointing out truth and we change to accept that truth. No, now it gets personal. Now this ain't about the issue at hand. We just want to make you look bad. So what did they do? They said, we heard him saying some stuff against Moses, speaking blasphemy against Moses and against God. So guess what, people? They lied on him. If you can't beat them, lie. Let me say this. Let's, let's just be very clear in our understanding on this. To the offended party, these from the synagogue of the Libertines, from Alexandria, uh, from Cyrene, from all these different places, to those people right there, they did not want to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God and say, maybe Stephen is right as we discourse with him. No, no, it wasn't about truth anymore. It was about winning the argument. And so what they did was, since we can't beat him, then we'll just lie on him. Since we can't, we can't defeat the message, let's now defame the messenger. Let me say this to every faithful servant of God. Listen to me when I tell you, please put your sandwich down, mute your television in the background. Unjust criticism and outright lies sometime is the cost of being used by God. If you think you can be obedient to God, do what the word says, share what his word says, stand on the word and say, here's what the Bible says. This is as a group what we should do. And if not the group, you can be like Joshua. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. If you think that makes you exempt from lies and unjust criticism, you're fooling yourself. It comes with the territory. I, I, it's, it's funny. I've spoken to young people that were still kind of living street life. You know, they're on the corner. They got their blue rag. They got their you know, red rag. You know, they got their hat to a certain side, all indicating all kinds of stuff. And in talking with some of them, I've heard stories in the past, hasn't been recently. Man, the cops, the cops robbed me and took my drugs and took my money. The, the, the cops arrested me and planted drugs on me. I tried to make a sale to this person and that person and, and somebody shot my corner up or, or, or somebody came and took my drugs and the, the, the person who's on drugs, I thought it was a $10 bill, it was a $1 bill. And I would respond to him and say, let me tell you something. When you do illegal activities, that comes with the territory. That's why you shouldn't be doing it. What, what? So you're doing something illegal. You come up against cops that should represent, you know, the law, but they do things. Like, let, 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 what do you expect to happen? Like it comes with the territory and in a positive way, it may seem negative, but in a positive way, when you live for God, when you obey what the word says, when you stand on what his word says, when you share his word, even in a local church like Stephen did in the synagogue, guess what? Trouble will come your way. That's not for you to be pessimistic and to quit. That's not so that you can say, oh, I must be doing the wrong thing and turn and go back into the world. No, 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 no. That is just the cost of discipleship difficulties that we encounter when we are doing what God says do and we push through it, that is what strengthens our faith. That's what increases our dependence on God. That's what makes us more mature disciples for the Lord. Doing what's right does have a cost. And guess what? Sometimes the cost that is associated with our obedience 
It can be unjust criticism. It could be outright lies. How many women who are faithful to their husband and y'all have your own arrangement? I've seen examples to where the husband and wife say, hey, listen, if we're going to buy something over a certain amount, we'll check with each other just to make sure out of respect, that's okay. We don't want to mess up the account or whatever. How many times, I cannot tell you how many times, I've seen somebody criticize a marriage like that. Sometimes criticizing the woman, saying, he ain't your daddy. What you doing? What, is the man putting hands on you? Is he abusing you? Why you got to call him to spend $500 or whatever the limit is? Who he supposed to be, this, that, and the other? People can criticize a happy marriage where y'all have agreed on what you're going to do. No one's being harmed. There's no harm. There's no foul. And most of the time, the people criticizing you don't even have a man. So to, And that's offensive. That's frustrating. You're like, well, wait, wait. All I'm doing is trying to be a loving wife. All I'm doing is trying to be a loving husband. All I'm doing is trying to honor my wife and love my wife like Christ loved the church. All I'm trying to do is let my husband be the spiritual head of our home like he says in Ephesians 5. That's, I'm just trying to do what the Bible says do. And I get talked about? Well, the answer is yes. And, and this criticism, sometimes outright lies, can come out in a plethora of ways. So if you think as Christians, we can escape these things just because we're following the Lord, it doesn't work that way. Don't get me wrong. You'll have more good days than bad. But to think you'll have no bad days is a fallacy. Let me say it this way, and we'll move on to verse 12. Christians get lied on to. Christians have been fired for no reason to. Christians have been robbed too. Yeah, Christians have come home and somebody has broken in their house. Christians have gotten sick too. Christians have been deceived too. Just because we follow the Lord does not put us in a bubble and make us exempt from the pressures of living in a sinful world. And sometimes because of our devotion to God, it can actually even attract things to come our way because there's nothing in the text that would suggest to us that Stephen did something to bring this on. So they, they lied. They heard him say, we've, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Verse 12. And guess what they did? They stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. They came upon him and caught him. They snatched him. They grabbed him and brought him before the council. The council is the Sanhedrin council. It was a council of 70 elders, 70 Jewish elders, and it would be presided over by the high priest. It would be like the Supreme Court of Jewish religion. But the key phrase we want to examine in verse number 12 is, they stirred up the people. They stirred the people up. I want to say this. This is an x-ray. This is the anatomy of how people try to spread malice throughout the church. Guess what they do? They recruit other people to see things their way. Now notice, all these things have come upon Stephen. And Stephen has plenty of reason to throw in the towel. As I said earlier, if you're looking for a reason to say I'm done, you'll have plenty of them. Satan will see to it that you have them. People will see to it that you have them but they stirred up the people. They were recruiting people to look at Stephen through colored lenses. Listen, I've seen situations, and y'all put an amen or a thumbs up or put some kind of indication to let me know maybe you've seen this from afar, maybe you've experienced it. I've seen people influence other people 
to be mad at a third person who's never done anything to him. Have, has anybody ever seen that? <laughs> you get, you, listen, you got another person mad at somebody in a whole other part of the church, so to speak, or some other ministry, and they've never even had a conversation with you. Never had a, a cross word with you. Somebody has influenced you to be mad at somebody else who hasn't done a word to you. And the accusations that they were using to stir people up against Stephen, they were lies, falsehoods. They were not true. Here's a warning. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful who pours that negative stuff in your ear. Be careful of who calls you and sends you these texts and say, girl, let me tell you. Now, don't tell nobody I told you, but let me tell you about so-and-so, such-and-so. Be careful about the under the table, in the dark, juvenile, lunchroom gossip that kids, young people, and sometimes even adults fall victim to. Be careful who you follow. They may be leading you astray. Don't allow somebody else to influence you not to participate with, have a good relationship with, or to look negatively against somebody else. Stephen could say, all I've done is give God's word. I got this contingent of all these men coming to me from all these places where the Jews have settled, who have been set free from Rome. They dispute with me as we went over biblical facts. They couldn't win. They didn't win. So since they couldn't get me with the truth, let's get them with a lie. They accuse me of blaspheming the name of Moses and of God. And then they're stirring up people, recruiting people to see things their way that probably didn't even hear the conversation and probably were just listening blindly to what these mean people are saying about me. It, um, how many of you, and I just want your participation tonight. How many of you would be comfortable? Just say, yes, I would, or no, I wouldn't. Would you be comfortable if somebody said, close your eyes and open your mouth? I'm going to give you some food. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't know if you clean your hands. I don't know if you're playing a joke on me. I don't know if you're putting some crazy stuff in my mouth. I'm not going to. That takes a lot of trust. Now, you might do it for your wife, your husband. You might do it for a spouse, a parent, a grandparent. You might even do it for a son or a daughter. But how many would just close your eyes, open your mouth wide, and say, here, you can put whatever in my mouth you want to? That is equivalent to what you allow to happen when somebody stirs you up, recruits you to go against somebody, and you ain't even had a conversation with them. They putting junk in your mouth, stuff in your mouth. And listen, we wouldn't do it physically, but how many people have fallen victim to do it verbally? You allow people to put stuff in your mouth and got you talking bad against somebody and you hadn't even had a conversation with them. That's because, and I heard somebody say this before, but it bears repeating right now. Listen to me. Nobody really cares about the truth if the lie is more entertaining than the truth. Woo! Listen, I can't give the person credit who said it, but listen, that's the truth. Nobody cares about the truth if the lie is more entertaining than what the truth really is. Imagine if you were a person who was confronted by the people from the synagogue of the Libertines, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, the men of Cilicia and Asia. Imagine if you were the person and somebody came to you and they said, Stephen is blaspheming. He's blaspheming Moses. He's blaspheming the name of our God. And you just began to ask some qualifying questions. Well, how do you know? Well, where were you? Well, when did y'all have this conversation? Really? Well, why did y'all have the conversation? Well, what was his response? Well, where is Stephen? Let me talk to Stephen. I'm here on your side. Let me talk to Stephen. Let, let me find out his point of view. Listen, 
I work downtown. I'm, I'm all over the city, but my home office is downtown. And in working downtown, there are a lot of people who are in need, some sleeping on the streets, under blankets, in the corners. I see them all the time. And sometimes you get approached by some of these people who are in need, and they'll ask for some assistance. They'll ask for money. Now, I have to be very careful. I have to be very practical because there are some who are just victims of hard time who just need some help. There are others who may have other issues going on. They may have mental issues, mental health issues. They may have drug issues. I don't know. So my disclaimer to them is, sir, I, I don't want to, to think I'm being rude, but I'm going to ask you some questions. I, I just want to be able to properly help you the best way I can. And one guy said he took a bus from wherever. He just got baptized. He's a Christian. He loved the Lord. He needs some money to get here, to get there, get here, get there, whatever. And I said, okay, I gave him my spiel. I'm going to ask you some questions. Well, where are you from? Okay, how'd you get here? Well, why'd you use your money on a bus ticket just to get here? Okay, wh wh where's your mother? Well, where's your father? You have any siblings? You have any kids? Really? Do, look, I got a phone. Is there somebody I can call? Well, why are you trying to go there? Why are you trying? And listen, when you ask these responsible probing questions, you can find out fairly quickly if a person is serious or if a person is just trying to kind of scam in a sense, to, to some degree. You ought to learn. We ought to learn to do that when somebody brings us a nice piece of gossip. You know, Stephen's a blasphemer. Well, where were you? Where was Stephen? Well, why'd you go there? What, what did he say? Who else was there? Let me talk to Stephen. Really? Did, when you ask these probing questions, you're showing that you're not going to be someone who just closes their eyes and opens their mouth and lets somebody put in there whatever they want to put in there. But we can see in verse number 12, there's a whole bunch of people that got stirred up. Uh, they stirred up the people, the elders, the scribes, and they believed the story so much, they acted on it to the point to where they snatched him, they caught him and brought him before the Sanhedrin council. Now, now. And they even went further to even further prove that their motives were malicious to even further prove that they didn't have good intention, that they could not resist the wisdom and the spirit that Stephen spoke to them by. To even further prove it, verse 13 says, they set up false witnesses. They introduced people who agreed beforehand that we're going to testify on your behalf. We're going to hold your hands in the lie that you're telling. You see, some of the people that went against Stephen, they were not deceived. They knew full well what they were doing. They knew they were wrong. They knew what these Jews from all these lands that had been set free, they knew their motives were wrong. And guess what? They knew they were wrong, and they agreed to do wrong with them. Big problem in the church. When you know that you're wrong, stay with me here. When you know that you're lying, when you know the people you stand beside are lying, and you still have the gall, you still have the boldness to stand in God's church with a lie beside somebody else who's lying and you're bringing down, attempting to bring down someone who's just trying to do God's work. Your real problem is not with Stephen. Your real problem is with the God that Stephen's, Stephen serves. You see, now you're in trouble. Listen, listen, when Saul was on that Damascus road and Jesus came down and blinded him, this was not some light from a shiny object. This was not the noonday sun. This was Christ coming down in his full Shekinah glory and he blinded Steve and knocked him off his high horse. 
If I could sing, we'll cue the organ up and we'll say, let the light from the lighthouse, let it shine on me. And he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? In other words, you think you're going to bring these Christians back to Jerusalem bound as you're on this Damascus road. But when you mess with my people who are doing my will, who are living according to my word, and you go and interfere with that, your issue is not with them in Damascus, your issue is with me. Now we have a classic confrontation of men who are finite and sinful and unholy going against a holy God and you will lose every time. Now, to the person who might be in Stephen's place, it don't feel like it. Oftentimes you feel alone. You feel upset. You're outnumbered. People are telling obvious lies. People are believing obvious lies. The contingent against you is growing and you want justice. You want vengeance. You want to defend yourself. But remember what we said about Christ on the cross this past Sunday. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Easy to say, hard to truly have as an attitude of heart. But here we see all of these people, they set up false witnesses. This was prearranged, verse 13. This was set up. This was talked about. This was discussed. Here's what you're going to do. Here's what I want you to say. And you say this, you say that. We know it's false, but our goal is not truth. Our goal is malice. And yet Stephen is still faithful through all of this. Stephen is still devoted to God through all of this. And they say in verse 13, this man does not cease. I mean, this is constant to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. And then they even put words in his mouth. We have heard him say, now they lying. They lied through their teeth. We heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth, verse 14, he's going to destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered unto us. Now, what, what, what they're referring to, this could have been a part of their discussion about Christ versus the Mosaic law. The indication that these Jews were probably Judaizers, is you can look at the sentence when they accused him. He speaks blasphemous words against Moses and against the law. That's in verse 11. They put Mo uh, against Moses and against God. They put Moses' name before God. It could have been that these were Judaizers. These were men that did not believe that Christ was who he said he was, and they still believed that the law was supreme, and here they mischaracterize a portion of scripture in the New Testament, which comes from John chapter 2, verses 19 to 21. That's when Jesus spoke those words that said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up again. But he was speaking about him, his body. The meaning behind John 2, verses 19 to 21, is that Jesus was saying about he himself, he, when he died, when he was crucified, and when he was resurrected, he would take the place of the temple. And by dying for sin and being raised from the dead, in effect, when I die, the temple system dies. You see, you don't have to bring some grain to the church anymore. You don't have to bring a, a, a dove to the church anymore. You don't have to bring a lamb slain to the church anymore. That system has been done away with. Our system of forgiveness is not by bringing a tangible offering to the house of God and God putting his wrath on that offering. So the offering, the animal, something guilt or innocent has been slain for someone who is guilty. That took place with Jesus Christ on the cross. God poured out his vengeance and judgment of sin on Jesus for our sakes. The temple system is over. We don't have a sacrificial system. 
As a matter of fact, Paul said, you want to sacrifice? Present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable act of worship. So they mischaracterize, probably intentionally, words from Christ and possibly portion of words from Stephen. So that's the whole of chapter six. And we're almost done here. And it says, and the council looked at him, verse 15, as if he had the face of an angel. Turn over to chapter seven, verse one. And then the high priest who's over the Sanhedrin council, they were in this colonnade that was cut into stone. It was an amphitheater. All eyes are on Stephen. He's been snatched from a place of comfort by enemies who are lying on him. He's outnumbered. He's got men that are setting up false statements. You got false witnesses. They bring false charges. All of this is a lie. And to this point, Stephen has said nothing. And let me just pause before we get to verse two. The best thing you can do sometime when the nonsense is surrounding your name, when the lies are circulating around who you are, when you got people who are lying, co co uh, uh, coercing other people to believe a lie, when you got people who are lying and they got other people who know they are lying come against you. Sometimes the best thing you can do is shut your mouth. Don't say a word. It will be a time to speak, but don't say a word. And let me tell you why it is beneficial. In many cases, depending on the nature and the extent of the situation, I'm speaking in general terms. Let me tell you why it's beneficial to be quiet. Let me tell you why. Because God will fight for you. Lord, he will. I don't care what nobody say. Listen. You can't make me doubt that. I've been through it too many times. I've seen it too many times. If you just hold your peace, God will fight for you. Yes, he will. You ain't got to go tit for tat. You ain't got to swat down every lie. You ain't got to swat down every innuendo. You ain't got to chase this person down and chase that person down and call this person and try to convince this person. Shut your mouth because vengeance is mine and I will repay, said the Lord. God has a better chance of taking care of all your enemies than you do. God's going to win every time. Don't you know there are people that know they lying on you? And they will never give you the satisfaction of admitting to you that they're lying on you. It's a power struggle. They know they're lying. You know they're lying. They know that you know that they're lying. But they will never give you the satisfaction of saying, yeah, you're right, I'm lying. Please. If they are that rebellious enough to bring up false witnesses, to bring up false statements themselves, to lie before the Sanhedrin council, to stand in the synagogue, in our case, to stand in the church and spread lies and other folk will hold hands with them knowing they're lying and go forward with it. If they're that carnal, you think you can go to them and reason them to admitting the truth? They would have to, at that point, display a level of integrity and honesty that if they had it in the first place, they wouldn't be lying to begin with. So guess what, Rodney? Shut up. Guess what to anybody else put your name in there? I ain't going to say shut up to you. Hold your peace. Be quiet. To this point, they just the only talking Stephen has done has been when he was disputing with them from the book, from the scriptures. When he was teaching them what God's word says, that's the only dispute. From that point on, he's been quiet. Everybody else has been talking. But what did I tell you? The truth will walk down a lie every time. I know the lies get up and will go around the world twice before the truth gets out of bed. But the truth, like Basil Shabazz, like Tracy Caldwell, like Ken Biley, the truth will walk down a lie every time. God will see to it. Oh, yes, it will. The truth wins in the end. So he's been quiet. And he didn't speak 
until Acts chapter 7, verse 1, they asked him to say something. They say in Acts chapter 7, verse 1, Stephen, are these things so? Are these things true? Are the accusations that they're making against you blasphemy against Moses? Blasphemy against God? All these negative things, they got witnesses. They got statements. You got people from different territories, from Libya, from Turkey. That's where those places were located. You got people from the Far East. Made their way to where we made their way to where we are. And man, they're saying some horrible things about you. Say it ain't so, Stephen. Now here we got from verse 2 of Acts chapter 7 to verse 53 of Acts chapter 7. That's Stephen talking. And let me tell you something. Let, 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 let me help you with this. In everything that Stephen says. Lord, this is hard, this is hard, this is hard, but sometimes it's so necessary. In everything that Stephen says from Acts chapter 7, verse 2, down to verse 53, he never defends himself. The focus that Stephen has as he speaks with wisdom and the Holy Spirit is not on him, but it's on him in heaven. Look, I'll walk you through it. In Acts, in, in verse 2, Stephen begins to talk about how God called Abraham. He said, God called him and he said, follow me and I'll show you where we're going. In Acts chapter seven, in verse number eight of chapter seven, he talks about Abraham begot Isaac, how Isaac begot Jacob and how Jacob got the 12 patriarchs or his 12 sons. He talks about Jacob. In Acts chapter, in, in verse 9, he says, now this Jacob, he was sold into slavery. He was in Egyptian bondage. And while he was in slavery, and then God's people went into slavery. They were in slavery for 400 years. Then in verse 20, he said, Moses was born while he was in Egypt. They were taking babies and they were multiplying so fast, they were throwing babies in the Nile River. And during that time period, God chose to give birth on the scene to a little baby Moses that was raised up in Pharaoh's house right under his nose. And then God allowed Moses to grow for 40 years. Moses broke up a fight, but Moses forgot he had killed a man. And they said, how are you going to stop us from killing each other? Are you going to kill us like you did that Egyptian's body you hid in the sand? Moses fled to Midian. And then in verse number 30, he said how God calls Moses out of Midian back into Egypt to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And he went in with mighty signs and wonders. He led them out after 10 plagues. And then in verse 36, how Moses led the people across the Red Sea. And when Moses took them across the Red Sea, they were in that wilderness for all that time. And then guess what? As they began to develop as a nation, there was a man named David who had a son named Solomon and Solomon built a temple. We call it Solomon's temple, but it's really God's temple. It's associated with Solomon because he was the one that had the financing to get it done. David had the idea but Solomon got the building contract and he built the Lord a temple. And then when you get to Acts chapter seven, let's, let's plant here. Verse 51 and 52. He closes out his sermon by saying, you stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do you, which of the prophets have not your fathers, verse 52, persecuted and they have slain them, which he showed before of the coming of the capital, just one talking about Jesus. He said of whom talking about the just one talking about Jesus, you have been now the betrayers and murderers. He said nothing about himself. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Solomon, God's people, Egyptian bondage, 
all the prophets that y'all, he says in verse 51 and verse 52, y'all are rebellious. You come from a long line of rebellious people. You are betrayers and murderers. Now, let me just say this. You cannot have unity. There's no way to get it without first having accountability. Can't happen. Can't happen. You can't have somebody who outright offends you on purpose, maliciously, directly. And then there's a period of time where you don't see them. And then y'all finally meet up again. And let's just act like nothing happened. No, we, we, we got to address this. This must be addressed. There's no way you can have unity without accountability. And here's what Stephen did. Stephen just went down through biblical history, through the Old Testament, all the way up to Jesus, the just one. And he said, y'all accusing me of blasphemy, which is false. But this council, the high priest, all these other priests, Caiaphas, Annas, y'all are the ones that had Jesus put to death. Listen, he gave them the truth. Then you jump down in verse 54. It says, when they heard these things, Acts 7, verse 54, they were cut to their heart and they gnashed on their teeth at him. That just was a way to say they were infuriated with him. Instead of, instead of yielding to the truth, they hardened their hearts. In verse 58, they stoned him. Stephen's faithfulness cost him his life. These events took place in the best commentary, say, two, possibly three days. He was one of the first martyrs of the New Testament church. Stephen was killed over a lie and he still stood on the truth. These individuals had reflexive opposition against him. Here's the illustrations to my life. And I'll just speak about me. When I read a story about Stephen, knowing that the Bible is true, it's accurate, it's real. When I read a story like this about Stephen, who was faithful unto death, it saddens me. It convicts me is a better word. Because sometimes I just be so tired. Sometimes I, I, I look, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Oh, I just need a break. And yeah, 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 breaks and rest. That, that's, it's all, you know, necessary. It all has its place. But some of the stuff that made me, as I gave the story at the beginning, want to quit, it was nothing like this. I mean, we've all had our share of misunderstandings. I'm sure everybody who's been serving the Lord in a local church for longer than two minutes has had some kind of issue fall upon them and you didn't do anything to instigate it. That's true. It will happen. But some of the stuff that will make me want to throw in the white towel are way down the list compared to what Stephen went through. So let me say this as we close this lesson. God honors faithfulness. He does. When Stephen died, the heavens opened. He saw the Lord standing. He saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And the chapter closes, one of the later verses, by saying he gave up the ghost. He fell asleep. He died. A Christian died. My life has never been on the line for serving the Lord. I've never really had a real threat of my life. You know, you have some nasty stuff that happens, but I ain't never had nobody threaten to whoop me. 
Well, I had one person to do it, and he couldn't whip me. That, pff, let me be quiet. Point being, I've never had a situation like this, like what Stephen has encountered. God honors faithfulness. So to the person that may be thinking of throwing in the towel, I don't know. Let me just tell you this. Pray about it. Pray about what God really wants you to do. Sometimes God allows a test. Satan may try to use it as temptation, but sometimes God allows a test. And he's like, hang in there. And when you make it to the other side of the storm, you might be muddy. You might have tears in your eyes. You might have wounds. You might have been church hurt. But when you make it to the other side of the storm, it is so much sweeter. It's such a blessing. It really increases your strength, increases your dependence, your trust in the Lord. And you know what it means when the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all of your ways and he will, yes, he will, he'll direct your path. So I'm, I'll go ahead and close right here. We've gone through this lesson about Stephen, a faithful servant of God. Just wanted to walk us through these verses to hopefully get some people to be encouraged, uh, to be instructed and informed. Uh, let's make sure that we are not the groups that are bringing someone down that's just doing what God says. Let's make sure that we, you, I, as individuals, don't allow our opinion of someone to be colored based on somebody else's experience with them. Know them for yourself. Ask qualifying questions to what people know. They can't just bring something to you and have you close your eyes and open your mouth. And guess what? You ask questions enough time, most folks won't even bring stuff to you because they know you're going to ask questions and their intentions may not be pure. So it will even end up being a defense down the road. Folk ain't even going to bring gossip to you because they know you won't just swallow it hook, line, and sinker. And when the road gets rough, and sometimes it can and will get rough, even when you do what's right, when the road gets rough, if you hold on to God's unchanging hand, I know I'm not the only witness that can testify. God will pull you through. So be encouraged tonight. We appreciate your time with this Bible study. Uh, Lord willing, we'll be back Sunday morning, Sunday school at 9.30 a.m., morning worship at 10.45 a.m. I pray that you guys have a beautiful, wonderful, peaceful rest of the evening. For those like myself that have to, as we'd say in Pine Bluff, go meet that mule in the morning. Hey, let's get some rest tonight <laughs> and be thankful God has blessed us with a job. For those that have worked for decades and God has blessed you to see greener pastures and now you can retire and volunteer and travel if you want to and work on the stuff around your house. Hey, we thank the Lord for you too. You are such an encouragement to me and many others. You give us something to shoot for. You let us know that it can be done one day. So God bless you and God keep you is my prayer. I pray only the truth will set you free. Amen, Brother Smith. You're so right. Brother Tim's bless you. God bless you to all of you. I pray you have a wonderful rest of the evening. So good night and God bless you.